what he should know. The implications here are numerous and essential in discussing the role of historical knowledge in waging struggle as indispensable strategic knowledge. And it is in a real and relevant sense, this, this, this passage in a real and relevant sense anticipates and points to Sun Tzu's similar observation in his Art of War. Indeed, Sun Tzu says, if you know yourself and your enemy, you need not fear law in any battle. But if you, and if you know yourself and not your enemy, for every battle you win, you lose one. But if you know neither yourself nor your enemy, you will be thoroughly defeated every time. Here again, then, we remember, I'm in a minimum argument that one who fights on the field of battle forgetful of the past, will not achieve a good end, for he is unaware of what he should know. And we must know our history. And here again, Malcolm also reminds us of the insensibility of historical knowledge and cultural memory to wage, to, to really wage the liberation struggle, to really free ourselves culturally, psychologically, and politically. And so now we turn to Malcolm in his discussion. The life and legacy of Malcolm X, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, weighs heavy in the scales of African and human history, measuring as a mountain's weight against the light, least light and less notable lives of would-be detractors. As I've written elsewhere, Malcolm is an inhotepian man, multidimensional, offering a series of models and messages of rich and timeless value. As a model master, teacher, student, organizer, critical thinker and revolutionary, and as a model of black manhood in the most moral, mental, and cooperatively practiced way. Moreover, he is rightly conceived and honored as a soldier servant of the people and a moral teacher. Thus his measure and meaning lie in his written and oral teaching, as well as his living practice text, which provides us numerous models and messages of infinite and enduring value, of which only a few can be identified and discussed. Malcolm is concerned that we understand ourselves and our humanity in an expansive way, not only as a part of the rising rebellious and revolutionary tide of history, but also as bearers of dignity and divinity worthy of the highest respect and equal and inalienable rights, and to fight fiercely and uncompromisingly for those rights. He tells us, as a moral teacher, like our ancestors told us, we must think deeply and to think in self-determined ways as an ethical obligation. And we must root our his thinking in the historical context so that we can understand where we came from, where we are, and where we should be moving. He tells an audience of African American college students, quote, one of the first things I think young people nowadays should learn is how to see for themselves, listen for themselves, and think for themselves, unquote. Ever mindful of the awesome burden of history, placed on each generation and the critical juncture which, at which they stood. He continues saying, quote, this generation, especially our people, has a burden more than any other time in history, unquote. Thus he concludes, re-emphasizing, quote, the most important thing that we can do is think for ourselves. Okay. Indeed, like Franz Fanon and Sekou Touré, he knew that the decolonized mind precedes and makes possible political decolonization, even if the process continues after liberation. Right. Malcolm also stressed a culture return to Africa and a Pan-Africanism that reflects culture and political consciousness and active commitment. And it would mean Malcolm August returning to the source of Africa in culturally grounded ways and linking together in common and urgent work and struggle for liberation. I met Malcolm in the summer of 61 at Mars 27 in Los Angeles where I had gone with friends to hear him lecture. Afterward, he invited us to come to the Muslim restaurant to and we had to limp on a host of religious, social, political, and cultural issues. Real, realizing I was going to catch the bus, he drove me home himself, and we continued wide-ranging conversation. From this time, from this time on, I tried to come to hear him lecture whenever he came to town, followed closely his work and press coverage deeply about his teaching taught to him. He would always refer by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's right. 
But he also created holidays for Malcolm. I understood his assassination as a martyrdom, a courageous sacrifice of self for the life and liberation of our people. I celebrated Malcolm's birthday and established another holiday in his honor called Kuzaliwa, the day of birth, the same year. And many people were silent and were afraid to stand up because of the established order and other things going on. At that same time, in a pan-African spirit, we, and an anti-imperialist spirit, we reaffirmed not only Malcolm's contribution to us, but we paid homage to the martyred Congolese premier, Patrice Lumumba. And we denounced the Vietnam War as racist, immoral, and illegal, and called for resistance to the war and the draft. Since the 60s then, we of the organization us have seen ourselves as heirs and custodians of Malcolm's legacy, not only in the general way that all black power advocates lay rightful claim to him, his legacy and legacy, but also in a more comprehensive, depthful, and sustained way through the study, teachings, and application of his most central ideas, embracing them as an expansive black culture nationalism that was revolutionary because of his commitment to radical self and social transformation and the overturning of both self and society. And because it was what Malcolm rightly called a rational and compelling reason uh, <clears throat> Uh, and the demand of our own liberation. Indeed, we took seriously in both principle and practice Malcolm's teaching on self-transformation in and for liberation struggle. Wake up, clean up, and stand up, he said. We took seriously the indispensability of cultural revolution that he taught as a weapon and emancipatory process to prepare, aid, and sustain the struggle. We also accepted his return to the source Africa culturally, psychologically, and spiritually the right and responsibility of self-defense, resistance, and the struggle for freedom, quote, by any means necessary, armed or otherwise. We also accepted his Pan-Africanism, a religion with a God in our own image and interest, and which is committed to justice, liberation, and the liberation struggle. We accepted also his Black United Front strategy and Third World Solidarity, and it is in this context and from this standpoint that we engage in critical and rightful of Malcolm and try as best as we can to live his legacy, to offer a rightful reading of his legacy, and to challenge those historic uh, imp interpretations that miss the mark, falsify, trivialize, or in any other way tend to reinvent and render less meaningful this awesome legacy and shared African heritage. And thus it is within this framework of history and practice and the call for rightful remembrance intellectual grounding and critical concern for keeping and expanding Malcolm's legacy, the critique of Manny Marble's new book on Malcolm becomes imperative. Yes. Okay. Every work reflects consciously and unconsciously a philosophical framework within which it is rooted, conceived, and carried out. No matter what claims are made about objectivity and detached critical analysis, and Marble's recent posthumously published and problematic book on the life of Minister Malcolm X, El Haj, Malik Shabazz, is not exempt from this rule of reality. Right. Indeed, Marvel's work and the subsequent controversy of denunciation and praise which surround it raises larger questions beyond the book about how we understand and interpret history as critical and rightful remembrance. It also raises interrelated questions of how we address the tendency of so many black intellectuals to embrace the deconstruction approach to history and humanity, right? Pursuing criticism as an act of faith, regardless of what kind, and revelation of the unseemly as proof of progress toward, quote, unquote, humanizing persons thought to be in need of it. <laughs> Clearly, deconstructive writing is critical analysis we were already doing in black studies. In fact, we came into being criticizing white people and white established order. If fresh, give me if I'm wrong. But deconstructionism, in most negative, in its most negative form, can easily degenerate into collecting and musing over trivia, trash, and other extraneous information, whose sensationalist character becomes a substitute, <clears throat> whose sensationalist character becomes a substitute for things relevant and more intellectually rewarding. Indeed, it becomes little more than a passionate pursuit of racialized pathology by another name. And at its worth, it takes the form of what I call scavenger history. <laughs> the constant 
the constant search for stench and stain. Bot bot bottom bottom feeding on salacious, on the salacious, unseemly, and sensational. This leads to pretensions and claims of revealing new material and offering original sights into things already found earlier by others, but were rejected as uninstructive and unuseful to a more disciplined and rigorous scholarship. Yeah. It's Malcolm himself who affirmed that, quote, of all our studies, history is best qualified to reward our research, unquote. But this is in the Malcolmian critical thinking tradition. It assumes a mind receptive to discovery, not one determined to prove preconceptions. Yeah. And it presupposes an emancipatory intent in pursuit of knowledge, not one that binds the mind in ever tighter conceptual change, forced and offered as liberational tools by the established order. Uh -huh. And that's what deconstruction has become, really. Another, I, uh, another tighter conceptual chain, forced and offered as a liberational tool by the established order. As Malcolm noted, a scientist for that, as Malcolm noted in a lecture at Harvard, the logic of the press can be the logic of the press if they seek liberation. Right. And he states, quote, there just has to be a new system of reason and logic devised by us if we want liberation. Marlboro embraced the deconstruction approach to the life of Malcolm X as one of repeated reinvention as the title of his book, Malcolm X, a life of reinvention, indicate. It is this academically faddish and popular culture category. Reinventing. What is that? <laughs> it is this academically faddish and popular culture category that informs and problematizes Marvel's work. For it can be understood as an expression of agency or indictment. Thus, it can reflect creative and constructive change or manipulative masking and shape shifting of the most indictable kind. But Malcolm has already said in his autobiography, my whole life has been a chronology of changes. But he says, despite my firm convictions, I've always been a man who tried to face facts and to accept the reality of life as new experiences and new knowledge unfolds. I have always kept an open mind, which is necessary to the flexibility that must go hand in hand with every intelligent search for truth. That's right.